The Action Man, 27 and 8. Huge weekend in NYC, <laughs> man. Doesn't the get Mecca. bigger. All right, that was, a, that was a weird fucking weekend, honestly. It was a very weird weekend. I'm still trying to process it. Today's episode of the Schmo Zone is brought to you by Manscaped. And I know David is a proud supporter and loves using Manscaped because our bathroom literally is full of Manscaped products. And why don't you tell the audience why you love it so much? It's like a one-stop shop for all of my daily needs. I'm talking about this Lawnmower 4.0. This is my favorite thing right here. The light on there too. Now, as you know, you always got to trim, right, Helen? Yeah. <laughs> and this thing, I've never bled, never cut myself shaving because of it. Loved using their lawnmower 4.0, the weed whacker for the nose hairs, the air hairs. Yeah. Very, very clean. I know it's November, no shave schmovember, but uh, we'll get to be using these at the end of the month or I guess the beginning of December. Yeah, well, because I was going to say you using the weed whacker because we all know you're a pretty hairy man and your nose hairs, you know, get pretty long. But not only that, though. Why are you lying about my nose hairs? <laughs> it's my chest hairs that get long. Let's be real here. Well, that too. And never mind. But <laughs> okay. not only are those products good, but I do know that Manscaped recently came out with a two-in-one shampoo and conditioner, right? That's right. It smells good, too. They got their body wash as well, but also, too, I mean, they have a cologne. They have their ball wash, which is great, their crop cleanser. All these different products that can fulfill your needs for smelling great in those most intimate private areas. Check them out and go use the promo code SHMO to get 20% off. Manscaped.com. Promo code SHMO, 20% off. Men, you won't regret it. It's that one-stop shop, and trust me, your woman will thank you. And finally, oh. the USC debut, MSG. You get the job done. Biggest stage. First round knockout. USC 268. Went, in three weeks, I went from thinking, like, man, like, you know, maybe this is the end of it. I'm just going to try to bang out, like, 10 fights in a year and be done with it, to knocking out a guy who was, like, on the cusp of being ranked in a first round knocked out Madison Square Garden in a fight they never said I was going to win. Now I'm like, shit, what do I do? Like, all right, well, what comes next? So. It's crazy, too, because Phil Hawes, his last two fights, uh, it was against Amalvov, who just beat the number 11th ranked guy, Edmund Shabazian. Oh, yeah. He destroyed yeah. Edmund. And, yeah. I, I mean, there. And then Kyle Dawkins, too, who had the no contest yeah, with because, Kevin Holland. Yeah. So he's been fighting kind of the cream of crop in the middleweight division. You get this guy, and... You take him out at the end of the first round. Yeah, man, it sucks to be him. <laughs> like, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. We got like what, like thirty-six fights now. His first UFC fight, but I mean, I've been doing this for I've been a professional for ten years now. Like, I've been around for a long time, so it's just weird though, because like, man, I'm like that kind of puts a weird tar you're in a weird position. Like, what do I do now? Like, I can't just go fight anybody. So now I'm like, well, do I like try to work up at the eighty-five rankings? Do I go to seventy? What do I do? So. Now we're just kind of like, all right, well, this is a uh, – we were excited for the fight, but we never gave any thought to, like, what comes next. And now that we're here, we're like, oh. Yeah, but I heard you in the post-fight press conference. You were even throwing out December. Yeah, I'm, I'm told I'm down. Like, if they can give me a fight December, January, I am down. Like, I, I'm i 34, man. I'm not a young kid in this sport. So I train seven days a week. Like, I don't, you know, I don't fuck around or whatever. So I'm like, I would gladly hop in December. I don't got to take any time off. I'm trying to make as much money as possible in the time frame I have left because I'm not going to have a 10-year career. You know, I'm not going to fight to the end of my 40s. Like, it's just not going to happen. So if I can fight, like, December, January, then maybe again, like, March, I am down for it. Like, I'm just, I'm just trying to bang them out. You said a few weeks before the fight you were contemplating retirement. Yeah, I was, it's funny, man, like, Right before I got the initial call, I was actually talking to Eric Nipsick over at Extreme. I'm like, you know, like, I'm just reached that point to where I'm, you don't think it's going to happen anymore. So we're just like, you know, he's, he's telling me this, 
to stay in it, but I'm like I've heard that for years. Like stay in it, stay in it. You have your ups and downs. You do all the right stuff, and you don't get you don't get your shots. I'm just like you know, maybe I'll just bang out ten fights this year. I had four fights before that. I was like, I'll try to get ten fights this year. If I get signed, cool. If not, like you know, I'll be happy making going ten and zero for a year, and then you're walking away from it. So you reach that point, you're just like you know, like I just. Fighters have shelf life, man. I'm 34. I've been doing this for a long time. Like, you don't get any younger doing this. It takes years off of you. And you don't want to be one of those guys who hangs around too long. And you, you know, we, we, we all see it. Like, guys who refuse to give up and they refuse to hang it up when they should, when their body starts slowing down. And you don't want to be that guy. So you're just like, you know, I'll try to make a bang now when I can. If they sign me, then we'll keep going. If not, got to go find something else to do. So did you retire twice before? I have. I retired once after, after Contenders. 2018 it was God, the was yeah. i think it was 2018 it was the second season the first episode you got the tko victory in the third round and you didn't get signed hook kick there's like four in ufc uh existing didn't get signed I signed greg hardy instead yeah how'd that work out like yeah they got greg hardy and that dude doesn't know the rules so like good for that and they signed someone this season who didn't make weight it's like you know what's funny is everyone on my season on my episode that won who didn't get signed initially had been signed already and like they've all gone fought multiple times i was just the one guy left out and then you see after like that episode he starts handing i think the one that's the episode after that he handed out like five contracts and i'm like what the hell man like yeah. now he good guy missed weight he gets a contract i'm just like what did i do like i was gonna ask you what do you think it was that night going back to it like when you've had time to reflect that they didn't sign you i don't know man like it's I stopped the guy. Apparently, I, maybe like I waited too long, but like Kevin Holland decisioned his guy, and he got signed later, before me. So I'm just like, I don't understand. To this day, no one still knows, and we're all just kind of like, it's just your luck, man. Accept it. But on the bright side, though, then you know Madison Square Garden, probably the most anticipated card of the year, 268, that first round knockout. This is like by far the best card of the year. And yeah. like, dude, my special power is like failing forward. So like when things go wrong, at least I end up in like kind of good spots. Like I missed uh, contenders, but I fell into PFL. This time I missed, uh, you know, I missed whatever, uh, the first fight in the apex. But they're like, oh yeah, go fight a Madison Square Garden. I'm like, Okay, cool. Like one bucket list thing down. Yeah. UFC fight, two bucket list. And then I knock out a guy in the first round. I'm just like, this could not have happened any better. And let's go back to the circumstances. You were the biggest underdog, three to one underdog. And he landed more strikes and significant strikes again, too. 0 for 3 in the takedowns, though. But all it took was the one that mattered the most, man. And the, when you ripped, ripped his body, I mean, you oh, just yeah, saw yeah. he yeah. crumbled a little bit there. It was weird, man. So, like, uh, <laughs> it's the first time in my life going into the fight, I wasn't the big, scary black guy. And, like, he was a big, scary black guy. And I was like, holy shit, is that what that feels like? So we touched gloves, and I was like, he is big. Like, he was not this big yesterday. So it was the first time in my career, I'm like, I may have made a significant like miscalculation in, like, the size of this man. So that fight started, man. He's just, like, hats off to him. Like, you know, he can be a dick about things, but he's a hell of an athlete, man. Like, I realized real quick that, like, I'm not the better athlete here. It's one of those times where like, I have none of the physical advantages. But, uh... I said before, man. Like he, he's an athlete. But I'm, I'm a, I'm a fighter, man. He's, he's a athlete who fights. I'm a dog who fights. So you know, this is what I do. I think uh, I'm just a tougher human being than he is. Uh, kind of had to weather that storm. Like he was trying to kill me, but luckily for me, you know, I'm a very durable dude. And uh, as clean, that was the best I've ever seen him look in a fight. Like he is hats off to him. His striking caught me off guard. I don't think he'd be that clean, but he still punches like a wrestler. If like that makes sense, like you know, strikers. Someone who's grown up like striking, like we snap when we punch, right? Like a lot of guys who come from wrestling, they tend to load. Even when it was clean, they push. They don't snap, they push. So a lot of it, like, I'm kind of getting hit on blocking stuff, but it's not like that concussive, like, oh, crap, I got hit. He's just moving me. So I decided really quick, like, look, this dude is super strong. I can't just stand my ground. He's going to run through me. But if, if he hits me, if I just move with it, I'm not taking any damage. It sucks on like on film to see it. Like He's like shoving me around like a little kid. It sucks, but I didn't take any damage. Front kick sucked, but like the punching was fine. So sucks on video to see getting shoved around. Like, it looks like you're getting beat up. But I didn't take like, no, It's fine. I don't care. I didn't take any damage. I'm not hurt, and I still won. So, like, you know, fuck your stats. 
So what was fight week like for you? Because this is something you've anticipated for such a long time. And to have this fight card, I mean, obviously with yeah. what's going on in New York and the craziness there, the pandemic, the masks, everything, like how did fight week feel for you? Normal, which is weird, man. I, you know, you think everybody talks about the jitters and everything else. It just felt normal to me, man. But like, this is what, fight number 35? It's really cool to be there. It's cool to, like, to be a part of it and do the media and stuff, but it just felt like every other fight week for me, which is kind of a blessing and a curse, I guess, because like, you, know, you want to get excited and have the experience, and it was just cool, but at the same time, I'm like, man, this is my job. Like, I'm not, I think he thinks I'm, you know, I'm like starstruck, whatever. I'm like, bro, this has been my job for 10 years, day in, day out, no breaks. So, blessing and a curse, man, but like, it, was, it was just, it felt normal to me. I felt fine. I didn't feel overwhelmed. I didn't feel like starstruck. I'm just like, it's an, every other fight week I've ever done. So once you do something for so long, it's kind of, it's just, it's just going to work, man. Like, how do you feel coming to work every day? You're just like, yeah, I like my job. It's, you know, it's cool. I, I like what I do, but it doesn't freak me out. Like, it's, it's just what we do. So did all this come about too? Cause Duran Willian or Duran Wynn kind of fell out as an opponent. Yeah, we, I still have no idea what happened to him. They said medical, like he was, got pulled out for medical reasons. And no that was his original he, opponent, Phil Hawes. Yeah, uh, okay. on the car, the Apex car. The Apex it car. Happen, yeah. It didn't happen. And then you were supposed to fight him. Or how did, basically, how did this all come together? So it was that Thursday before that fight, I get home from sparring. And funny thing, I got rocked that day in sparring too, which is what sucked. Like, I got cracked in the face and I seriously rocked. Do we know the, the guy? Does it start with a, an S and rhyme no, with No, it a... actually wasn't. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay. It wasn't Sean Strickland, surprisingly. No. I got caught. I got rocked that day. So whatever. So I go home, eat a huge dinner, go shower, and uh, I, get, I hop in bed. Someone's pounding on my front door. It's my man. I'm at my door. I'm like, it's my manager. I'm like, what's up? He's like, what do you weigh right now? I'm like, I don't know. Check my weight, 197. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, if we make 185 tomorrow morning, we're in the UFC. And before we even knew how, I've even said, no, I was fighting. I was like, let's do it. Like, we're going to, well, we can make 85. It's fine. Like, it's 11 pounds. It sucks with no prep. But you're like, you know, fuck it. This is my chance. And then you're going to fight in Phil Hall's. Uh, it's really funny, though. He was actually at one of the gyms I trained at, like, two weeks before that prior. And that was the one day I didn't spar. So the one day wow. I decided to not go, uh, not train, Phil Hall's was there. Because he sparred Strickland and other people. But I'm like, what a, like, weird coincidence. So... Missed him on that one. And then uh, I was like, let's go. So I got up. We went to – we cut 10 pounds in about three hours. Woke up the next morning, drove to weigh-ins. We go weigh in. Everything's fine. That's the messed up thing. Like, had I got there and they'd be like, oh, the fight's off. You'd be like, okay. But, like, I weighed in. I did, like – I'm, like, off doing medicals. And then they're like, yeah, you're not fighting. And I'm like, okay, that's different. I didn't know you could just say no, but, like, apparently that's a thing. You can just say you don't want to do it. I don't know all the uh, details behind it. No one's ever really said anything, but I guess he just decided he didn't want to take that risk. Which you know, sucks for him. I was already rocked, so hey, it probably would have been a better. <laughs> so then they moved it to UFC wow. 268 because you had already committed. If you did not cut the weight that night, if you didn't drive yourself to the apex that next morning, you wouldn't have had the opportunity to be at Madison Square Garden. Uh, you know, freaking uh, one of my favorite sayings ever is uh, who dares wins. And like, you know, it's right. I was like, they're like, oh, it's up a weight class against a guy who's trying to get right, you know, who's just outside the rankings. And I'm like, screw it. Why not? Like I fought big, I fought bigger dudes before. I've never been the biggest guy in my weight. I've always fought. I came up a long time ago, man. Like now you got, we have, we didn't have contenders. We didn't have like these past. We didn't even have like real management when I first started. So like I had taken some horrific fights in my day. Like my fifth fight was against Tom Galecchio. And that was just, like 26 fight with my really good buddies. Now it's like his 26 fights, my fifth fight. My eighth fight, I fought Force Pets. His retirement fight it was his 34th fight. I was like, yeah, I'll fight him. I'm like, sure. So I've taken hard fights my entire life. I've taken fights I wasn't supposed to win. It's whatever. Like, why not? And you took a fight with Bilal Muhammad in 2014. Yeah. That was that actually wasn't terrible because, like, I was, like, that was more so my fuck up than anything else. Like, everything leading up to that fight was god awful. And then just the fight was terrible. That's up to Bilal, though. You know, he, he skyrocketed after that. So I take credit for that. Like, hope he sees that. <laughs> but yeah, man, I've always, I've, I've never been afraid of hard fights. Like, it's never been an issue for me. So I was like, why not? Like, what do I have to lose? Like, no, this is what I wanted. What's the worst that can happen? I get knocked out. Like, okay. Like, so what? Like, I'm still alive and I get my shot. So I'd rather, uh, I'd rather get in the UFC, even if I freaking fail, even if I like washed out. 
that's more important to me than never having an opportunity to see how far I can go. Like the worst thing ever is to devote your life to something, like dedicate all of your time, sacrifice, and then never get to see how far you can go in it. Amen. I completely yeah. agree. Well, that's why David has actually convinced me to get back into swimming because I devoted all my life into it and I was forced to quit, but now I'm trying to train for the 2024 Olympic trials. And why not? Because like exactly. how much like you, you, you spend like your the, whole life sacrificing and pursuing, yeah. a, pursuing a dream. I do like I God, I like my it, it sucks because like you spend like you sacrifice the people you care about have to sacrifice. Yeah, it's, I tell people like fighting is a really selfish sport because like. It's not just you that pays. And like, I guess any sport's selfish, honestly, because it's not you that has it's to pay. True. It's the people that care about you, they're around you. You know, like you're missing an engagement, you can't go yeah. do stuff. There's a, you know, you miss birthdays, important events, everything. Get your time's always taken by something. So, like, yeah. to sacrifice all of that and then never, you reach a point to where it's not about like failing, it's about never knowing like what your ceiling was. And like, that's. Yeah. That's why, you know, I'll get, I walk, tried to walk away a few times and even the people around me are like, are you going to be, even my son was like, what are you going to do though? Like, well, are you okay with it? I'm like, I'm not really okay with it. Like, it's the worst feeling ever. So yeah, like, you know, like you definitely know. Yeah. Well, did your son watch that fight? Yeah, <laughs> he does. He does. He did. He did watch it. It's funny though, because my son, uh, I had my first amateur fight two weeks after he was born. And he was there for that one. So he's his entire life, he's just known me to fight. It's always ever known. Like, you know, uh, when I was when he was really young, I didn't have a car and I was training. So I was taking a two hour bus ride with a newborn wow. in a car and a stroller to the gym every day. So I always known as me fighting. So now he's not even excited. He's like, Yeah, you did good. Uh you got hit more than I would like, but uh you didn't even look bad. Like he's not excited or anything. He's like critiques me now. I'm like, All right, that's kinda strange, but all right, he, he just doesn't care. He's as long as I'm okay and we hang out and play video games, he doesn't actually care. He's like, whatever. Is it something you think he wants to do later on? Or oh, God, no. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, he's, no. He's, he, uh, I tried to give him the box and wrestle for it a little bit, and he's like, look, man, like, he's, he's not, it's not for me. I'm like, it doesn't have to be. It's fine. It's just not his thing. And he likes fighting, but he's got his mind. He's, he's like me at that age where he's like his head in the clouds. He's a super creative kid. He wants to do other stuff. I'm like, you know what? Don't fight pay's not that great and your brain cells will thank you later so like go do something else well after the fight i know when you spoke to joe rogan you said that sean strickland was he yelling at you <laughs> or so i'm gonna make a, I get a compilation made of like sean strickland <laughs> in my corner because sean strickland if you're, there's i have fights to where sean strickland is like heckling me then he heckles my opponent then he's a heck like at one point in the fight he stopped coach he stopped cornering me he started coaching my opponent against me <laughs> like, I'm, just, like, I'm dead serious. <laughs> How he started. That he started coaching my opponent against me. He's like, starts. I'm just like, really, man. He's just Sean is his own thing. So, at one point, Sean's like, "You're fighting like a pussy. Stop." And I'm like, "You know what? Fine. Maybe you're right." And uh, that gets like a time when Joe Rogan's like, "Oh, he's got to do something to get his respect." So I'm like, "You know what? I've taken. You know, we've we've taken enough time. He's slowed down enough. I can start like applying myself now." But. uh Every fighter's different, man. I'm a guy who, like, I need somebody occasionally on the outside to be like, okay, you're taking too long. Because, like, you, th you time's really different, like, in the fight. Like, everything's kind of, everything feels like it's not going as fast as it is. So, like, sometimes you're burning time. You just don't get it. Like, you're just like, you know, it doesn't feel like it's going that fast. So, I need somebody to not sugarcoat it. Like, hey, like, don't be a bitch. Like, go finish. Like, okay. And worked out well. And how riled up was Sean Strickland that he wasn't even <laughs> able to fight on the fight card he was supposed to fight because Luke Rockhold had to pull out of the fight because yeah. of the injury. God, he, uh, the, the Luke Rockhold Sean Strickland beef will forever be one of the right. funniest. Will we ever see them fight? <laughs> I don't. I don't think they will, and it's fine. But like Sean has the biggest hate boner for Luke Rockhold, and it's it's a, it's an uncomfortable hate boner, and like it's. He gets like messages. They go. He just picks on him. I'm like, bro, this dude's gonna shoot you one day. <laughs> like, Luke Rockhold's probably going to like murder you for just being this dick. But like, it's cool though. It worked out for me though. He'd be selfish about it. But I got to have like one of my uh, like best friends and one of my best training partners in the corner with me. And like, he knows how I function. So it was kind of cool to see him freak out. Like, yeah, the entire time he's screaming like, just knock him out. You're better than him. You're better than him. And like. Sometimes you need that reinforcement when you're doing stuff. And he's just like, just finish him. And he lost his shit. So it was great to see. 
I think, and you feel free to chime in, you'll know more, and from just from me watching from the outside and watching some of your practices and shit, he seems like a really freaking great teammate, and I'm sure he can get under skin of some people who don't like that personality, but overall, deep down inside, he seems like <laughs> his intentions are for the best, and uh, I could see him being a good friend to the people he likes. Bro, deep down inside, he's a really great dude, but it's also covered by layers of just like... I don't even know what to call. He's he's incredibly abrasive to like a lot of people, but I think it's abrasive if you don't understand that like you just, I I just don't take anything he says like personally. And people like society is very like sensitive now about things. We're very careful about what we say. He's just a throwback to like what we were when like we were out as like Vikings and like mercenaries on a battlefield. He's a throwback to that time. Like he says what he feels and like he doesn't sugarcoat it. So positive or negative, you know, he just says how he feels and it rubs people the wrong way because we're used to being a little bit more like tactful about things but at the same time like the dude will literally give you the shirt off his back he'll mock you for it the entire time but he will actually give you the shirt off his back like he's if you ever need to like work for a fight or you got something coming up you need to work he's the first guy in the room and he'll be like i'll do it this is what we do let's go and he'll be about it but he's gonna go about it in the most abrasive sean strickland way possible so once people like people, people loosen up and learn to not take him as uh like seriously and like don't take it personally, he's a really fun dude to be around. Like he almost got me killed one time when he took me paddle boarding and like I I don't paddle board, I don't do water. Paddle boarding is fun. I am the most like seasick dude ever. Like I don't motion sickness is a thing that just like rocks me. He's like I've never seen someone get like pad, like motion sick on a paddle board. I'm in like the like the freaking uh San Diego Bay like dying about to fall off a paddle board, <laughs> pass out. I'm like dude, I'm gonna die here. But I mean, he's just he's a, he's a really fun dude, man. He's a really good dude. People just have to learn to like not take things so personally. Well, one of your, or I guess the Schmo's best interviews, right, was with Sean Strickland. I'm sure he caught you off guard or no? <laughs> I would say that's lo- the leading Schmo interview of the year. But yeah. you make a cameo at I the know, end. I know, I did like, see what is that? You that. creep in there Show after British. I have a special power to just, like, show up in the back of things. Like, it the was weird, great. like, creepy, yeah. Yeah, because usually I'm always with David when he does all the interviews and stuff. But I wasn't there with him that day. And then, and then or I, in New York. Or in New York because I was sick, coughing. I'm okay now, though. But it was rough. It yeah. sucked. I, I, yeah, I... I don't get sick that often. She didn't so. have COVID, though. No. I, I've got COVID twice. I understand. I've gotten oh. it twice. It's been fucking miserable. Well, I didn't go with you. But then when I re-watched that <laughs> interview, and then when, what was he saying to you? Like, you remind him of those kids in high school or I something? Oh, I, yeah. I, he, how he hated you because you got laid in high school, probably. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, like Sasquatch in the background, like kind of like show up, like, fully fade away. Yeah. That was great. And, and after that moment, it was all uphill for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> See, that, <laughs> That's so true. Maybe after that was, maybe was just moment. Yeah, it was just moment. Yeah, maybe, maybe there's something there. Like, so maybe you're onto something. I don't, know. I don't know, but go back to something you said earlier. You're gonna ride this thing out. You know, you talked about having this window and stuff like that. Thirty four years, not young or whatever. Like, how do you know how long this thing is gonna last? You're gonna ride the wave. Do you have some sort of shelf life in the back of your mind, or how are you gonna take this thing moving forward? Uh, I know that. Am I? I know that I have at least four years in me. Like, I'm lucky. I'm not a guy who had a bunch of knee surgeries or anything like that. I'm really durable, like thank you know, thank the ancestors there. I got really good genetics. I'm really durable. I haven't had any too. I'm not too beat up, so I know I can like squeeze out at least four good solid years, like 34, 35, like our best years now. I just want to go these next four years. I just want to get every fight in that I can. Like I mean, I think I'm like tied right now for the most fights, the most uh, wins in a year right now with a. Uh, I forgot who I'm tied with. I'm tied with somebody right now. And then Are like, they in the UFC? Yeah. It's T Rex. What's it? Uh, oh, Terrence McKinney. Terrence McKinney, yeah. McKinney, yeah. I'm tied with McKinney right now. He for had most a ways. crazy injury over in Arizona. He's yeah. he's coming back though. He's coming yeah. back pretty soon. He's uh like I think he's on the eleventh card. Yeah. 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 He's coming so up. I'm tied he's with him right now for most wins and most finishes. I think Kayla Harrison as well. I think it's a three way tie. Or I think McKinney may be in front. I don't know. So I'm trying to pass him up, man. I'm trying to get every fight I possibly can. Like I'm never going to have this opportunity again. So why not just run with it? Like I'm healthy. I don't I don't get out of shape, so I'm just trying to take every fight they can give me, man. Like why not make the money I can and get as far as I can and have something to tell my kids about or grandkids about, you know, when uh the time comes. 
This is your division, middleweight 185, or would you fight a different weight class? I am naturally a welterweight. Right. So right now, I am just masquerading as a middleweight. (laughs) I'm just like, honestly, I don't know, man. I just stopped one of their most touted prospects. I didn't feel weak. I didn't feel too bad. I mean, he's definitely stronger than me. Like, dude's a freaking hoss, but... uh, I think we'll spend a little bit of time, like, you know, try to put out, put on some uh, weight, put on some strain and see how I feel. But for me to make 170, man, it's miserable. It's such a bad experience. Like, it's absolutely miserable. Like, like it's I hate it. It's really, like, lowers your quality of life. So I think I may just hang out at 85 for a little bit. Uh, things start going south at 85. We'll uh, scurry away to, middle, uh, to 170. I'm not afraid to be like, All right, peace out, I'm gone. But for right now, you know what, why not? I just beat one of the guys they were, like, really touting. Uh, he beat Imanov. Imanov's like what rank? Like he's gonna be like rank like eleven or some kind. Yeah, of like he's gonna that. take Edmund's yeah. position. Yeah, so I'm like maybe there's something to this. Like maybe I've been killing myself for no reason. I felt good. Fight week was good. Maybe there's something two eighty five. So we'll see. I like it. I like it. But speaking of one seventy, what did you make of the main event? Uh, I I was actually shocked that uh, Colby did as well as he did there. Like he uh. It was closer than I thought it was going to be. I thought Usman was going to blow him out, honestly. I really thought he was. Uh, Colby was tough, man. He's just a, such a tough dude. Like, it's unfortunate, like, to be – it sucks to be Colby Covington because you're the best dude on the planet if Kamaru Usman didn't exist. You're the best 170 in the world if there wasn't Kamaru Usman. Like, right now, there's always – every fighter knows there's one guy who's got your number. And uh, unfortunately for Colby, like, that one guy who has his number happens to be the champ. But, like – it was a hell of a fight, man. I really thought Usman was going to blow it through him. And, like, Colby was just like, I'm not going to die. I'm not going to go away. So I was actually really impressed. And Usman just keeps getting better every fight, which is absolutely terrifying. Is Usman the best welterweight of all time? Because everyone's now talked about yeah, GSP, or nah, Usman. Stuff. Like GSP. I think GSP still has that title. Like, Usman is on his way to, like, you know, being up there. But GSP had a run that was just absolutely insane like I, I would say Usman's probably the second best welterweight right of all time right now and like you know if he keeps this up and he can you know, like finish his career out like this then he could, I think he could pass GSP honestly like he's done some crazy stuff but GSP killed everything and everyone for years but yeah. as someone who's had 35 pro fights like yourself like you've seen the evolution of this game you're living in it right now <laughs> are the fighters better now than they were when you started out Oh, it's completely different, man. Like, I remember MMA before GSP fought Matt Serra. Yeah. And then Matt Serra beat GSP and ruined MMA for, like, six years. Because when GSP came back, it was, like, four years. When GSP came back, he was the wrestle-heavy GSP. And then everyone adopted that approach for a long time. Like, damn it, Matt Serra, you ruined MMA. <laughs> like, So, yeah, Matt Serra killed MMA for, like, three years. And now you're starting to see uh, it kind of shift. Like, the, the paradigm shift a little bit. To now, there's a shift to where... Now we went from the Chuck Liddell counter striker to the GSP like ground control to now it's just such a crazy mix of just all well rounders and then the Dagestanis. So like you're either an all rounder or you're a Dagestani wrestler. So like those are the two styles right now. But you just see everything change. Even the Dagestani wrestling style is so much different than like the traditional wrestling style that you see. It's so different, man. Like it's the the way they approach things, the way they do things is so different. And now you're seeing every other fighter start to like, you know, incorporate those techniques and like their methods of doing stuff and their grappling style. So now like we're in the middle of like what comes next is the prototype. The guys coming up now who are sixteen, seventeen in a gym are learning how to grapple like that from the beginning. I remember being an eighteen year old kid in the gym. And now I'm looking at, like, 16-year-olds. And I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be really bad. And it's weird when you see a kid who's, like, 15 or 16, like, training. And you're like, that kid's going to be a problem in the future. And then you're like, holy shit. Like, I'm, who is <laughs> he's going to be a problem in the future. You're like, ooh, thankfully I'll be done by the time it matters. But, like, man, it's 10 years from now, I'm really curious to see, like, the, where the caliber of fighter is. Like, it's, it's, it's gotten yeah. – I train a, nine, uh, a, ten, a 10-year-old girl. Sophia Montoya, and, like, she's all, she had her first fight already at nine years old. Wow. She fought at nine. It was the craziest experience ever. So we're out there, and uh, Sophia the Bull, and we're out in, uh, I forgot, I think we're in Florida. 
and she fights her first round, hard first round. So I go in the cage and like I'm like, hey, how are you feeling? Thinking like she's gonna be like younger, nine years old. You gotta be freaking out, right? You're fighting. She looks at me like I love this, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> concerning. I was like, all right, cool. Like not the answer I thought, but they're getting younger and younger, and they're just bred for it, man. I was just having this conversation the other day too, but think about what the UFC has done to the sport of mixed martial arts. Like think about this era and the time we're living in right now. Like think of professional football, professional baseball and basketball, the inception of it in the early part of the 20th century. We are living right now, this sport, 28 years old, like while this main sport has become, this mainstream sport, which it is now, top four in this country, and it's only going to climb uh, in this country and worldwide. It's just rising in popularity. We've been alive to see an yeah. entire sport kind of come into its own, right? and it's only growing now. It's only getting better. How long did it take the NFL to get, like, non-leather helmets? Into, right. like, something serious? But we've watched the evolution of, like, no gloves to, like, gloves to the current glove to, like, shoes. Shoes. To everything. Yeah. yeah, like, everything else, the rule change. Remember, like, that first, like, the first, like, two UFCs, the guy won via, like, constant nut like elbows to the nuts yes i'm and, like what and the fucking yeah. headbutts too? yeah like oh my and then, like the i remember it was ufc one the italian guy fought the sumo guy there's a french kickbox with a sumo guy and he like kicked him like the guy was down he kicked him in the face and he embedded his teeth in the guy's foot and now just to see like where it started to where it is and like it's kind of crazy to see in real time so now you're like where do we end up in 10 years like yeah, it was completely barbaric into a sport, yeah. which obviously at times can be barbaric, especially when you watch a fight like uh, what Gage and Chandler did to each other. Those guys would have fought oh to the gosh. death yeah, had there been no referee. It's yeah. the first time ever Incredible. I've seen this fight that good. And people were like, you know what? I'm glad with three rounds. Like, I don't want to see more. That was yeah. perfect. When the fans are like, thank you, we don't need more. <laughs> like that is, That's just the right amount. Like, that's a crazy thing because like, nobody wanted to see five rounds. We're all like, that's enough. Like, thank you. <laughs> you all are legends. No more, please. Go to a hospital. Yeah. That division, <laughs> too, is, is crazy. Yeah, like I would want to be a 55 or screw that. Like, that's probably the worst division to exist right now. Like, yeah. Yeah, and 170 when you're talking about, like, Hamzat. At 170. That, so, God, that dude... <laughs> Training with, I've trained with that guy for a while. That dude, I don't understand how he makes 170, first of all. He is massive. Like, that, that is a large human. And, like, I'm like, okay, he feels like 85, but he made 70 again. I'm like, what, what science is behind this? He is a massive dude. He's super strong. I do not understand, like, how he exists as a person. I am incredible. I, I, want, I want answers. Like, it is insane. It's mind-boggling. Hamza and Sean Strickland are two strongest people, like my size. Like just like but the two strongest dudes will run into. I'm like, why are you this strong? Like, it, like watching those two grapple is insane. I'm just like those it's, two grapple. Yeah, it's insane. I want to. What did yeah. that look like? Uh, they're <laughs> just like like you ever see like two cats just fight? Yeah, and they're just going. It, it's it's insane, man. Like they're just they're two dudes who are like really athletic and don't quit. And they're both they both have that mentality to where like they don't quit. And Strickland, someone who's fought at one seventy and then moved up to one eighty five. Hamzat's the type of guy that does both one seventy, one eighty five, but I think right now he's just focusing on fighting at one seventy. I don't know why though, man. Like I think honestly, eighty five is a much better path to a belt for him. Like I think eighty five is a much better He's so strong. He's had no issue at 85. Like, you know, it, I'm going to assume being that big, his life sucks getting to 70. He, was, uh, he wasn't around for that camp. I didn't see him at 70, but, like, I'm assuming it sucks. I'm, he's way bigger than me, and I struggle to get down. There's no way he's getting down easily. Like, I think 85 is a way easier path to a belt. Yeah. So Sean Strickland wants to be on the Anaheim card, but that's likely not going to happen. He wants to fight uh, Jack Hermanson, who I think has – also worked a lot with Hamzat as well. Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure they worked together a lot. But like, uh, and why is the end of the time going to happen? When is that? Well, that's January. January. Maybe it's going to happen. Uh, Maybe February. Because I, I don't know. Is it too late to add him to the card? Do you want to keep him to the, the next fight card? Is the card too full? Is it booked? Know. Have they booked that card yet? Who's headlining that? That's Francis Ngannou, who I'm going to ask you about next against Cyril Gunn. <laughs> and then Brandon Moreno and uh, Figueredo, too. Or three. three. Yeah. Damn. That's the main and co-main. Two belts on the line. That, ew, yeah, that's... I don't know. That's weird. I didn't, I didn't think about that at all. I didn't know that was the uh, 
the lineup that's pretty stacked already. It's gonna be it's gonna be a good card. Uh, wanted to ask you though too, because Francis Ngannou, obviously extreme couture. I'm not sure if you saw it too. Yeah. He's walking in the hallway. You have captured this because I saw Cyril because it he's was in like the a WWE corner. promo. It was yeah. so I was so awkward when I watched that. I was like, that is the most uncomfortable non-exchange I've ever seen. To where like you see something is so like awkward, it's so cringy. This for all around, you're like, bro, I'm I'm uncomfortable watching it. And like man, like Cyril, cats off the Cyril. He took like a champ. He's just like, all right, like that's fine. But Francis just walks by. That's the one dude you don't want like cold shouldering oh. you. I'm like, come on, bro. Like don't do that. No, I love everyone there, and like it was so funny. Just so you got this coach right next to him. Then you got the UFC PR guy, uh, Christoph, right there. So Francis stops, or Markel, his manager, was walking with him. Markel stopped, gave Christoph a hug, who's standing next to Fra- uh, uh, Cyril's coach, and Cyril standing there, and then just proceeded to walk completely forward that i was like oof like that was that's cool <laughs> that was it that was like one of the coldest things i've ever seen someone do on a camera and i was like all right francis like which is funny because he's the nicest warmest dude you yeah. ever like he's, he's the nicest so nice. dude ever yeah. like it's really weird to see like francis be like that's that's scary man because like he's the nicest most like well you see him hey hello kurt he's the nicest dude ever and to see him like Blank you out. I'm like, bro, that's concerning. I'm like, he, I don't want to see an angry Francis. <laughs> this this fight is. Oh, yeah. I, I'm so excited for this fight because you're talking about. We keep talking about training partners. Those two are training partners, so they know each other, and that's Francis's former coach as well. I mean, the storylines here are just automatically set up, and they both know the task at hand. I think he's just dialed in, laser focused, and let's get January through before we can be friends again. And that's the thing, man. Like you've seen, like how much Francis improves, like every fight, yeah. him being focused, and now he's like laser focused. I'm just like, the improvements are crazy. But now he's like dialed in. Like you're not gonna make a fool of me. And I'm like, bro, that's a scary, fr- that's a scary Francis Ngannou. Like, he's already freaking a nightmare. But now, like he's, you've never seen him act like that. And I'm like, that is concerning. Is he is he back at every practice right now? Is like I know. Training camp probably hasn't officially started yet, but is he back training kind of like full time in the gym right now? Well, I missed all last week, so I don't know if he was in or not because I was That's in. That's true. Yeah, you were in New York, so yeah. but he's a uh, that dude's him. Mean, he's super consistent. Plus, like now he has like you know champ now, so you have like big guys come in for him. So he kind of has like a separate practice. He'll still do a team practice, but he's like two practices every day or whatever he does. But I haven't seen him yet, but, like, my God, like, it's just, it's really insane to see somebody that big and, like, who improves that much. Now they're like, I'm, I'm serious. It's, it's rough. Yeah, I mean, when he was able to stuff Stipe's takedown in that, that yeah. second fight, you know, and, and even took the back there, I'm like, holy shit. So yeah. when he stuffed that first takedown, like, I told people, you could feel the collective, like, buttholes of the world, like, ooh, like, <laughs> tighten, like, ooh, this is ugly. And, like, it happened, and, like, I felt bad for Stipe for a second. I was like, oh, no. Like, because I'm looking cheering for France at the same time. I'm like, oh, like, is there a plan B? And there's not a good plan B. I'm like, oh, no. Like, we all know how this ends. It's like watch, like, you know, the horror movie, but you know how it ends already. And you're just like, oh, no, you're not going to make it, are you? And but, he did not. But you got to give him the trilogy fight. You gave it to DC. He's the consensus greatest heavyweight, at least in UFC history, if not all time, because you got people talking about Fedor and whatnot. Why don't you give Stipe the rem- the, the trilogy fight? I don't know why everybody like, UFC hates Stipe. I don't know what he did. I guess I, I think he may have been he may, uh, It kind of feels like he was a curse of like being the nice guy to where, like, you know, there's no Stipe drama. He's just a nice dude. He's like, all yeah. right, yeah, he's a nice dude, he's professional. And, like, it's what you want as a fighter. You want what you want your fighter to be. But on the flip side, like, you know, I don't think he's, like, bringing in the attention that they like, like, giant scary Francis or your, uh, you know, more outspoken guys. Stipe's just a regular dude, which is, like, really cool. But, you know, I don't think he's uh, the promotional powerhouse they want. Well, he's not, the, he's not even technically a full-time fighter because he's a firefighter, <laughs> yeah. too. How messed up is that? Like people out here getting smashed by a fireman. You're like, yeah, like, I do this part time. And you're like, huh? People like having all these crazy camps, training, living in the gym. He's like, yeah, man, I did a six hour shift and went and hit mitts. And like this dude just beating you up. That's got to be disheartening. And then isn't uh, Kyle Dawkins his brother? Uh, Chris Dawkins fighting. He's a, he's a police officer. 
hats off. You got off the cop. Them. You got the firefighter. Right. Hats off to them, man, because like heavyweights. Yeah, it's, it's right. It's the, the joy of the heavyweight mm-hmm. division. Being a heavyweight has its own set of rules. I feel like like you can. Your career lasts longer. There's like less you have to do. It's it's really it has its own set of rules. It's a privilege of Barely being a heavyweight. Barely any weight cut. Yeah, yeah right. I, I mean, that's why I was so impressed with Chris Barnett uh, yeah. doing the front flip <laughs> and the dancing uh, the other He's night. He's a good dancer. Yeah, so I was like, all right, like that's every that is my new favorite fighter is Chris <laughs> Barnett. And I was like, I will watch any anything you do. I will officially watch like for shits and giggles. That dude is just oh, he's he's out there. That's my new favorite fighter is Chris Barnett. He's the man. And his post-fight speech was very classy. He's just a great... Yeah. Oh, he gave... Uh, John Vellante. Yeah, John Vellante. Yeah, the mic. He's just... He's a good dude. Like, and yeah. it's, I'm happy to see that as well, because I know he's been around. I've known, I followed him for a while. You know that, you know, he's been around for a long time, and, like, he's waited for those shots a long time. It took him a long time to get here, too, so it's cool to see him get that win on Madison Square Garden. He, he, he deserved that 50K. Like, I'm happy he got it. So aside from your fight, what was your favorite fight to watch from UFC 268? Uncomfortably, Gaethje versus Chandler. Like that first I watched round. It, oh it was gosh. very. It was. It was one of those fights where I'm like, this is great. At the same time, I was like, I really wish this would stop, because <laughs> like they're like Gaethje's one of the just the, like one of the like my favorite fighters, just the way he is. But I also absolutely love Michael Chandler. Michael Chandler is like the most down to earth good dude. Everything he says is a motivational speech. Like, I'm just like, yeah. just listen to Michael Chandler talk about anything on repeat. And you'd be like, you know what? I can change my life. He's talking about barbecue sauce. You're like, I can't change my life with barbecue sauce, Michael Chandler. <laughs> so he's just a walking motivational speech. So, like, to watch them go at it like that, it was, it sucks to see one of them lose. But I'm like, I mean, you didn't lose any respect. The fans, fighters, and company are all like, bro, there's, you didn't lose any standing in that. It's just one of the greatest fights I've ever seen. Definitely. And it's like, what do you do from here for Michael Chandler? Because Gaethje, I think you have to give him the title shot next for the winner of Poirier Oliveira. I think he's earned that. But what do you do if you're Chandler? I mean, honestly, if Gaethje's the number one contender, then Chandler's number two. Like, it's just one of those things. So but like, what about Benil Dariush? Like, yeah, oh, see, number three. He's like on like a seven fight win streak. <laughs> Everyone forgets about him. <laughs> I keep bringing it all. I'm friends with Benil. <laughs> Shows like, oh, I forgot. I was like, oh yeah, he never did forget about Dariush. Yeah. And he's a, also another great dude who just deserves yeah. a shot. Yeah. So. I mean, well, there. Like, I think at the top five, that's just especially at fifty five, because how crazy it is. Like you cut off at the top five, and they're gonna have to fight it out, and they'll have one guy rotating through. But like, yeah, so the top five of fifty-five is just absolutely insane. It's a murderer's row. So, and then there's Islam too. That, yeah. That's also in what, the top what, five, I believe. Is he I, top five now? I think he's five, right? He was five before the before he fought Dan Hooker. Before, so he's so he didn't he didn't go up. He went down. So, well, honestly, like there you go. Like those five need to fight it out. And you know, why See just, what just yeah, like what else do you do with them? Like you can't I saw Chandler calling for Connor McGregor. Yeah. I think he beats the brakes off of Connor McGregor. I don't think Connor's gonna take that fight. I don't think Connor likes Well, I think anymore. Connor re or he tweeted him back. He said, you know, one day down the road, but yeah. I think I think obviously he would fight Poirier for the fourth time before that. And I still think that Nate Diaz trilogy, even though Nate's got one fight left yeah. in the deal. What are they? I can see do Nate waiting Nate? waiting to have his last fight with Conor McGregor so he gets that trilogy. That'll happen in like twenty twenty four. Like I'm not okay. gonna wait for that. It's like oh my god. It's... But you just said you don't think Conor I don't think he wants to fight. So Marvin Hagler, the boxer, one of the greatest boxers of all time, said it the best. It's hard to get up in the morning. I get up at four AM when you're sleeping on silk sheets. And what he means by that is once you get enough, like, once you've earned enough and you have enough, the fire starts to die. And I think a lot of people have seen that fire in Connor, like, comes and goes. Like, when he st- think about when he started, man, his attitude when he started versus the moment they gave him money. And he's just like, what does he have to fight for, man? Like, he's got everything he could possibly want. He already has a legacy. I mean, honestly, like, you know, half-assing it only hurts his legacy. He's got a legacy. His Nobody in his family will have to work ever again. Like, how do you make yourself go to the gym and sweat and bleed and suffer when, like, bro, my I, I, I made it. Like, you did it. Like, I don't think. It's just got to be a pride thing over anything at yeah. this point. Relevance. Like, every yeah. hard thing about, like, being an athlete, especially being in the limelight, whatever, is once the attention goes away, you don't want to give it up. Like, it's the the need for relevance. That's exactly what I feel like it is, too. It's like he's seeing all this go by, 
But even without him competing inside the octagon, he's by far the most popular fighter that's ever existed in mixed martial arts. Like he's more important to MMA than a Floyd Mayweather is to boxing. He's, I mean, he's the figurehead of the sport. Like, you know, for better or worse, it's Conor McGregor. They, that's the guy they, they blew up. They, they made him into yeah. that. And uh, you know, there's a fortunate side effect of like, how long does he have to do it? Because he's got everything you could possibly want. And like, yeah, we, we all want to be in the limelight. We all want attention. But that's not, that can't be your only motivation, man. Because like, when it comes down to it, when you're getting hit, when you're struggling in that fight, when you're in that last round and you're dead tired, you're not fighting for a check. You're like, I can go make half my check or whatever he's making. He's like, I'm, I've got millions in the bank. I don't have to be this. Like, why am I getting beat up for? And, like, that's where you see guys start to stumble. Yeah. No, it's it's very, very true. It's very yeah, true. I don't, I don't think he wants to fight anymore. I think he likes to fight, but I don't think he's – I think Conor McGregor can still fight. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think he's the fighter that he was because, like, it's hard to be a fighter without any hunger. Yeah. Like when you, when, you, when you made it, like what do you do from there? You hang on, you defend it for a while, then you're like, all right, I'm done. So what else can we cover to let the audience know about you, man? Because uh, I just want to keep seeing you be active, make a name for yourself. Yeah, we're very You've happy paid your for dues. you. It's it's been a wild ride, man. Thank you. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Like, I'm just, so I'm gonna tell you guys something seriously. I'm like Sean will tell you because he makes fun of me all the time. I'm like the least exciting fighter life ever. I train, I go home, I play way too many video games. Which like, kind of video games? I am a, right, I just actually got into PC, I just got PC. I was a, always a PlayStation guy, but I am a, uh, we'll range from like shooters, MMOs, everything, like uh, like MOBAs. Like Sean's like, you don't even play good stuff. Like he's like, I don't want to play, I don't want to be a wizard, I want to shoot people. I'm like, bro, I am the biggest nerd who's ever lived. Like, I'm a proud nerd, I've always been a nerd. I just have to be a nerd who can fight people, but like I am that guy, so like it's... I don't do anything, man. I don't really drink. I don't smoke. I don't, like, do stuff. I don't party. I just train and, like, play games. Like, my entire life has been getting here. So that's all I do, man. Like, outside of that, like, me and my son will play games for, like, six hours on the weekends until, like, one of us is, like, I'm getting a headache. we got to stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll play. So we, we play on, I play a lot with my son a lot. And uh, that's about it, man. Like, yeah, I'm trying to spend time with him or just hang out or train. That's it. Good. Uh, where can the audience find more of you? Uh, yeah, you guys can follow me on Twitter at ActionMan513. And it's going to be really confusing. But on Instagram as well, it's King of Combat 513 They're making me change that because I guess the UFC has forcibly decided, like, we're going to stick with the Action Man. So I didn't know what they were going to announce me as. I have, like, seven nicknames. So they picked Action Man. So oh, I guess so they picked it, not it was you. So that I've had, like, I have a rotating, like, selection of nicknames that we go through. Well, the Action Man is my original one. It's the one I've had the longest. Since how'd, I was, like, you, how'd you get that one? <laughs> uh, completely non-fighting related. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I was 16 at a girl's house, and my <laughs> friends were supposed to be, like, watching for her parents. And they kind of didn't watch. So her parents come home, and I have a choice to, like, get caught or jump out of a second-story window. So I decided that thinking 16 and me being an idiot – there's a tree there. I'm like, what I can do is jump out, grab the tree branch. <laughs> and in my head, I thought I'd jump. I'd swing from like branch to branch. So I got down, get the tree and go down. Jumped out, grabbed that first branch, snapped. Like, completely snapped. So now I'm tumbling down tree branches, like hitting every branch, like slam to the tree, hit the ground, like shatter my ankle. But I hit like a front roll and like come up running to the car as they're like family screaming in the background. Like, I'll get back here. So he ran to the car. There used to be a TV show when we were young called Action Man. Uh, so my, my buddy was like, oh, the goddamn Action Man over here. Like, tried to, like, play and miss out. Failed miserably, but still made it look cool. So at 16, I became the Action Man. I've had that name since I was 16 years old. I love that That's story. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think of that. I think of Demolition Man. Yeah, actually, like, Action Man, the greatest hero of them all, Action Man. So, like, yeah, that's uh, – if you guys haven't seen it, Google uh, – it's like, like 2001 Action Man cartoon. It was on Fox, and uh, you'll you'll see. It's the great. It's the most stupid cartoon ever. But that's what came up at the time where I didn't die from that. So I've been Action Man since I was 16. Well, the UFC picked the right nickname. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good. It's a good. It's, it's the oldest one. Yeah. So I guess I will. Ch it's a King of Combat 513 on Instagram. I will change it back to Action Man soon though. So it'll all be uniform.
So watch this podcast before we change it. That's how we do that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I don't even think we did an introduction for this. What episode number is this? 83? Yep. 83. Oh, we're getting close to 100. All right. Yeah, we're getting close getting to the century there. mark. We appreciate you coming on, especially, what, two days after the big victory. Yeah, it's been yeah. a it's been a wild weekend, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad to be here. It's fun to talk about it. I'm happy to be here because the only other option was I lost, and then I probably wouldn't be here. So, you know what? Everything went smooth. So, what's good? Hey, that's how life goes. Hey, you got to roll with it. You know, when you, uh, when you strike gold, you got to you strike, uh, strike oil, you got to roll with it. So, why not? Love that mindset. Episode 83 of the Schmozone podcast. With we, Chris Curtis. Chris Curtis. Because you didn't man. do the intro. So. Wow, I didn't even say Chris Curtis, the action man. All right. Wow, we just went right into it. Hello. <laughs> All right, we are out. <laughs>